So I'm about to, I just pressed the live. We'll go live in a few minutes, a couple of seconds. <clears throat> Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinet's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinet. The Jason Cabinet's Experience is brought to you by Cabinet's HR. Cabinet's HR, focus on your business. We've got your HR. Do you know it's estimated that small business owners lose $27 billion or estimated $10,000 per small business employee? It's also estimated that small business owners are spending 25% of their time on HR, time they'd be better spent to take care of the people, the customers, and building their business. Our guest today is Sasha Horn. Sasha, are you ready to be great today? Yes, I am. Hello. Empowering millennials and Gen Zers of diverse backgrounds to make their voices heard is a passion, passion of Sasha. An award-winning multi-platform storyteller, communication strategist, and creative entrepreneur, Sasha is known for her work in front of the camera as a reporter, host, and creator of Sasha Talks Tech. She is now a leading subject matter expert in digital media strategy and an advocate for, for promoting digital equity and using tech for good. Her tenure of broadcast journal, journalism started more than a decade ago as a graduate fellow, graduate fellow at CNN World Headquarters in Atlanta. From there, she wanted to cover a ver variety of topics from politics, entertainment, to tech and health. Some of her most memorial, memorable, memorable assignments include covering the 2012 Tea Party movement across the southern United States, the 2016 DNC and legalization of cannabis in more than a dozen states, and the shooting death of Michael Brown by the police in Ferguson, Missouri. Sasha, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Hi, Jason. Thank you for having me. So, Sasha, um, first question. Do you consider yourself a tech person, a journalist, an entrepreneur, a mentor, all the above, or something different? I think if I had to sum it up in one word, I would say a storyteller. And with that, um, I dabble in all of the above. So um, as it relates to tech, I don't necessarily have a background in tech, but I did have an affinity for telling the stories of entrepreneurs, particularly entrepreneurs from uh, disadvantaged backgrounds. And that's how my site Sasha Talks Tech was born. And the same with mentorship. Um, through social media, I was able to meet um, other people who were interested in careers similar to mine, and then was able to sort of create um, an opportunities around that. And so I think um, as a storyteller, I've been able to dabble into all of the above. So Sasha, you know, entrepreneurs, they have to be a great storyteller, whether if they're pitching for money, pitching customers, for the case, they got to be great storytellers. But it's, I don't, a lot of entrepreneurs are not great storytellers. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs to, be, to become great storytellers? Well, um, it is a gift. So, um, you know, one thing that you could do is perhaps um, link up with somebody who is a storyteller and talk to them about this. It could be um, anyone who you know who is a writer and just kind of bounce ideas off of them, explain to them your why, or ask them, hey, can you do like a mock interview with me? Because I'm really interested in trying to figure out what is my brand story. Uh, and that would be my advice if you're just, you know, that's, you're not good at that. If you're looking to take a stab at it yourself, I would start with your values. I would start with your why and um, the thing that motivates you to get out of bed every day, um, thing that you would do even if you um, were not getting paid to do it, uh, it tends to be at the core of your why. And so being able to tap into that will allow you to tap into that story. So Sasha, I like to say that I'm probably the most uh, tech, not tech person you ever find, right? So I think you're kind of the same way. You say you're not a tech person, but you're probably the most tech, not tech, tech person I know, right? <laughs> how, how do you like uh, move around the world of tech without not having a tech background? I think it really goes back to uh, the journalism aspect. I, there's no question that I can ask that's considered dumb because, hey, I'm just a journalist. You know, I don't, uh, I don't have to know the ins and outs of everything. I just need to know uh, the questions to ask to get you to explain to me how it works. And so because I have an interest in a lot of different things in tech, whether it's databases or um, whether it is of how to use um, tech to help um, public interest or disadvantaged communities, uh, I think for me, it's just amplifying those who have those brilliant tech minds by telling their stories. 
Um, and I think, you know, as you're going into it, you know, as a content creator, as someone who's curious, uh, you know, just by, by admitting, you know, I, this is not my area of expertise, but I'm very interested. And then you'll find that people are really willing to kind of break it down for you. So let's switch, let's switch to journalism real fast. So way, way back in the day, you know, you had like people, Walter Cronkite, you had like the three news agency, ABC, NBC, and CBS. And pretty much they were trusted. Like they could, they could have said aliens will come and everyone would believe them, right? Like they were really trusted. Nowadays, it's like people don't trust the media. They, if someone says something on the media, it's like they think it's, you know, it's like a, opinionated and, you know, the facts ain't right. Why, how come it's changed so much? And, and like, what was like, some people would say, well, all the news, all the news now is bad. The social media out there. I think it's a good thing. There's more voices out there, more chances like to hear the truth. But then again, there's so much trash out there too, right? So many people like that's so biased. How did this change? I mean, I know this is probably a long term, a long, a long range answer though. Well, I think one way, um, you know, when you're able to have different networks and, and different media outlets pop up, it gives people options. And, it's, you know, we're, we're naturally attracted to the things that interest us. So for instance, if you, you know, you only had three channels and those are the three channels you're going to watch, you're going to pick the, the, the host that you bonded with or that you, you liked the most or what have you primarily to watch your news. People didn't really switch among the networks. Now, when you have these different choices, um, you know, broadcasters are able to, to market to the audience that they're interested in and people are able to strictly just tune into that. And I think as, um, you know, we add commentary, which, you know, a lot of, a lot of news networks now, uh, not only do they just tell the story, just the facts, just the news, they also bring in pundits to um, provide commentary, um, to provide clarity, um, sometimes from both sides, sometimes just from one side. And so I think as there are more, these different opportunities to um, express yourself and express your voice, uh, it does, it can, does and can lead to misinformation. Um, I think it's important for individuals to make sure that they are not just skimming the headlines, uh, they're really looking into something before they're passing it along. I think that's important to try to, you know, if you see something and you find it interesting, rather than just sharing it, actually take a couple seconds and click through and make sure that it is what it says it is and it's not just clickbait. I think that's kind of one of those things. It's like our social responsibility as an individual. Um, but uh, kind of what you were saying about social media, I think that it has been a great platform to allow uh, independent media and people who have not had a voice in traditional media to have a voice. So it, there's, uh, you know, there's trade-offs, but I think um, if you do your due diligence and uh, do your research on, you know, maybe the funding or or the source behind some of the media that you're consuming, I think that would be, uh, you know, very beneficial. Yeah, I, I kind of know we have, we have like those like three branches of government, but sometimes I don't people don't realize that the media is kind of like a quasi fourth branch of, of the government, right? And a lot of people, I think a lot of people, media don't realize how important they are, like you know, making sure government runs. And a lot of people, like regular people, don't realize the impact media has on your, your on your thoughts and how you do things, right? I think that's really true that, um, you know, the impact is something that we kind of take for granted. And, you know, when you bring up media or digital media specifically, I mean, that pretty much includes everything now. We're able to stream, you know, news from all over the world. Um, you're able to read articles and things like that. There's different forums and Reddit and sites like that where you're able to go and kind of just find whatever topic you're interested in, find people who agree with whatever it is that you're saying, you know, and that, that can be powerful, you know, but it can also be uh, uh, dangerous. Yeah. And talking about clickbait, like I, I, I could understand if like a like small agency did clickbait, I kind of get it, you know, but it's like recent, like big news organizations are doing clickbait, like CNN, they did a story on Joe Rogan taking like animal medicine for COVID, which wasn't true. And so there's a big mess up on that. So it's just like, I, I think you have a good, good point. You say clickbait is everywhere, unfortunately. Yes, it is. And I think that's something that, you know, it comes down to, we have to kind of check the sources of where we're seeing things and, you know, maybe not necessarily just choose, um, you know, look at, okay, well, it was posted by this because, you know, there's false accounts out there and things like that as well. So you really have to kind of do your research, particularly before you share uh, uh, something that you're consuming online, I believe. Yeah, like I think recently, like people say, I did my research, but that means they, they they just read a couple of Facebook 
post them somewhere they follow, right? <laughs> yeah, it takes a little bit more than that, I would think. Yeah. So next, what exactly is digital media strategy? Uh, digital media strategy is just really helping creators um, and businesses, organizations, um, learn how to communicate and navigate the digital space. So this is everything from social media to blogging to um, you know mainstream media. Everyone has a digital platform now, and and just really learning how to tell your story across platforms and to get the message across in the most effective way. Um, just because uh, one person is doing this and you know you seeing everybody doing that doesn't mean that that's the most effective thing for you. And really what we do is use data-driven analytics to kind of dive in and take a look at, okay, this is what's performing well, this is what isn't. So maybe we need to invest more resources into column A instead of B and things like that. So it's really just providing insight into how to best tell your story. Because you I mean, we, you talk about all the different platforms, well, just because they're out there doesn't mean you have to be on every single one. Not that you shouldn't have your digital real estate reserved or brand reserved, but you don't have to actively um, participate in every single new social media platform or thing that comes out there. You need to look at where your target audience is and then double down on that. So Sasa, what makes someone a creator? Is there a definition for that? Like, does someone have to post like hundreds of times to become a creator or is this a one-time post? What, what's your definition of a creator? I think it's definitely changed. Um, you know, I've been in the blogging space since 2013. And, um, you know, in the past, I would say having a digital property like a blog or um, some sort of site that you're maintaining, um, whether it's a Facebook group, maybe you're curating a community, um, you know, that type of thing. Um, but now I really feel that a creator is anyone who uses their platform to tell stories. And the stories can be um, what you're doing right here with, with your um, podcast and where you're um, allowing um, entrepreneurs you meet to come on and tell their stories, uh, giving using your platform to amplify what they're doing, or it could be, um, you know, paying it forward in a way where you are um, bringing on interns or you are, um, and then you're having, helping them to tell their stories and create, um, create their brand online. And I think it really is born from the fact that now it's very important that we all have that digital real estate. It's important that um, particularly if you're in an industry um, like business with like what you're doing or even what I'm doing with media um, where it's very forward facing, you want people to be able to get in touch with you. It shouldn't be too difficult for people to be able to um, connect with you because that is kind of at the center of what it is that we're doing. So Sasha, I've been doing this podcast like a couple of years and that time I know 30 people started a podcast, only five of them started doing it. Other 25 quit pretty much because they didn't get Joe Rogan numbers in six months, right? Can you talk to points about creators having patience? Absolutely. Um, something that I was taught just kind of when I was going through building out Sasha Chalk's tech, like I said, that was around 2013. And um, it was, if you build it, they will come. And it's just important to make sure that you're consistent. And so for me, knowing that I have other projects and other things, I kind of just did it one chunk at a time. So um, I started the blog in 2013 with just weekly posts. When I was able to do, you know, more frequent posts, I would. Um, I had a weekly video series that I worked on for some time, and I kind of just um, would release it project at project. Um, I would wait until I kind of had a chunk of things done to then release that. And for me, that helped. Um, but the thing that I think is most important is just making sure that you are actually putting your name out there. You're not just creating the content and then just posting it and then hoping people see it, you're actually working with the, if like, for instance, if you're spotlighting folks, you're actually working with them to make sure that they're sharing it, um, that you're making it easy for them to share it on their social media platforms. Um, collaboration is the quickest way to grow. And while you may not, you know, get those numbers overnight, you, you will, I believe if you continue doing it, you will find um, opportunities, for instance, speaking engagements that have come up for me, opportunities to do project reviews, to do segments on local television stations across the US, all of those things came because of people who found my site. And like I said, it was just really at the beginning, just posting once a week. Yeah, that's a definitely good point. Cause I've been asked like speak at several conferences, like virtual conferences, it all came back to the podcast, you know? 
Yeah, it allows people to see you in action. Um, it, it gives you the credibility and it shows that you are able to consistently put out a product that people are interested in. And, you know, it, I think something that you do really well is making sure that you put it out on a variety of different platforms. You can't just, you know, do something. I can't just post a blog post on my, on my blog on WordPress and expect someone's going to read it. You have to take that post and you have to, you know, find ways. And I don't mean just tweet it out one time, you know, maybe find a group on social media, maybe Reddit or, or um, a thread on Twitter where people are talking about that conversation and find a way to organically add it in there. And it does take some work, but you know, it only takes like one, <laughs> one click, uh, one, one um, post like that where you shared it somewhere for, you know, it to get a lot of traction and, and people are now noticing the site. Sasa, can you talk about how you, how you do your content creation? Like what's your schedule? Like, you like, do you like 10 things in one day and spread out different days or how do you do that? Right now, I'm actually not really uh, in the content creation game as much as I used to be. I am uh, still blogging and the site is still updated um, several times a week, two to three times a week. But as far as um, content creation on social media, that's not something that I am doing right now. I, uh, I, during the pandemic, I kind of took a step back from that and just have been working on the business side. So um, I've been doing a little bit more behind the scenes, but um, right now my strategy really is um, if it's something that moves me or it's something that I, it's a partnership that I'm working on, I'll create content around that. But I'm thankful to be in the position where I can, you know, kind of just choose the, the partnerships that work best for me. Um, I do um, paid and unpaid collaborations. I don't always um, accept fees or anything like that for some of the collaborations, particularly if it's uh, a product or a service um, from a, someone who is from a multicultural background. Um, that's something that's really important to me. So yeah, I, uh, I, I kind of been a little picky and choosy about my, you know, Sasha uh, on social media and really have just been focusing on building um, the brand behind the scenes and working on things like updating the website and um, creating new partnerships and creating new digital properties. Sasha, how are you, how are you using tech for good? The way that I use tech for good is by um, not keeping everything I learned to myself. I, similar to how I met you, Jason, um, on Clubhouse, it's by going on platforms like Clubhouse or Twitter Spaces or you know YouTube, wherever, and just really sharing the knowledge that you have. And when you see someone who is doing something similar to what you're doing, reaching out to them and finding opportunities to collaborate and introduce them to others in your network. Um, that's something that I feel that it's really simple to do. You can start with where you are now. You don't have to have a whole bunch of followers. You don't have to have a huge audience. You can literally just, you know, look at the people that you, um, you admire or that you are collaborating with and ask them, you know, can I share your story? Is there um, something that I can do to amplify the work that you're doing? Because I really admire that. And that could be sending a tweet. It could be, you know, sending an email to someone who you think might like it. But I think that um, using your platform to serve others is, the, is a great way um, to get involved in um, using tech for good. So Sasha, you've covered many subjects that are journalists. Do you have a favorite subject to cover? I would say I really enjoy covering subcultures and that's kind of broad, but um, I can give you a few examples. For instance, um, in the intro, you talked about my coverage back, I believe it was uh, 2012 um, of the Tea Party. To me, that was a little bit of a subculture, you know, of as a woman of color being, you know, in this, you know, rally of pretty much, you know, all white people and their, you know, their uh, ideas and things did not necessarily align with, you know, where I stood, particularly because a lot of it had to do with um, the birth or movement and things like that with Barack Obama and, uh, you know, but it was just really fascinating to be there, to be able to, to use that journalism badge as a way to say, hey, you know, I'm not on anyone's side. I'm really just here to tell your story. So just, you know, explain to me, these are the questions that people who don't agree with you have. Can you answer them for me? Another example of um, a subculture is um, you talked about the legalization um, of cannabis. So a part of that covering that for um, 
I covered that for Snoop Dogg's uh, Need the Outlet, Mary Jane. And one of the things I did with that was really, you know, talking with people, these families, for instance, in South Carolina, this woman, her daughter was ill and she literally was moving all the way from South Carolina to California just so she could get this medical cannabis for her, her child. And it, it was just, you know, those are the stories that you don't typically hear um, when they're talking about legalization, but it's stuff that we were able to cover. And so that's what I kind of mean by subculture. It's just these little off the beaten path communities that, you know, you may not come into contact with, um, but I was able to do so uh, through journalism. Um, when do you think uh, cannabis will be legalized at the federal level? Any idea on that? I don't have any idea, but I do uh, hope that the decriminalization, particularly the equity that um, some, some programs, for instance, in Los Angeles, um, there's a program that focuses on um, making sure that um, people from black and brown communities who are you know, disenfranchised by the war on drugs are now able to own dispensaries. I hope that that type of equity is something that um, is able to be replicated um, across the U.S. as states um, go about legalizing it. But no yeah, predictions on federal. <laughs> yeah, that, that's one thing I have a big issue with, right? You have these people making millions of dollars on, on, on this, you know, product. You still got people in jail for it, right? I just, to me, that's, it's just so wrong. I, I don't know. This doesn't, this, is this not right? Yes, and um, that's something that I actually did cover a little bit, um, uh, contributing with BET Digital. Um, we, stuff, we covered uh, Kareem Webb's organization, the Fourth Movement, out in Los Angeles, and they are, um, you know, tapping into the um, South Los Angeles community, which, of course, you know, was hit with a lot of issues in the '90s, and and even continues with policing and things like that. And they're looking to uh, help the residents there have some ownership in the dispensaries that are now popping up in their neighborhoods and things like that. And so those organizations do exist, but they're not, um, you know, they're not everywhere. And so how do we take something like that and, and, and get that everywhere so that it's not just the rich people who are benefiting on the legalization, it's people who were, you know, getting locked up before that are now able to benefit. Yeah. I mean, I, I, mean, I don't think how you're going to stop legalization. It's going to be all, all over pretty soon. Cause like, you know, like you have grandmothers using it, you know, grandfathers, you know, like CB oils, creams, and aches and pains. Those medical research says it's, it's extra beneficial. So yeah, it's, I think it's going to happen sooner than later. Absolutely. So you, you've worked with, with numerous new agencies. Do you have a favorite one either, either because you like the way they do the news or you like working with them or any, any other thing? Um, yeah, I think I still, um, I have and always will be an NPR baby. <laughs> I, it's where I got my start working with the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I worked in radio there, and that was kind of um, the business side. And then I got uh, the opportunity to work uh, reporting and in communications at um, NPR affiliate stations. And I still listen to this day. I've always really enjoyed um, radio as a, a medium of storytelling, the audio storytelling. I love that it's back with the resurgence in podcasts and things like that. I think there's a lot that you can do with audio. And I think, you know, when you have a great, you know, story or what have you, when uh, for me, I'd know it's a great NPR story when I would just be in the car and I couldn't like, get, I couldn't turn off the radio. I arrived home, but I just had to like stop and listen to the rest of it. Cause it was just so interesting. So I think I would definitely put them at the top of my list. Um, other outlets that I definitely um, like to uh, read include uh, Blavity. Um, it's a, a Black women-owned uh, media company. Um, the founder, uh, she has kind of uh, found other Black-owned startups in the areas of travel and tech and uh, even film, and she's been able to kind of merge all the brands together and produce like really um, good content. I subscribe to their um, newsletter. And I also read that they're expanding to do some stuff on college campuses, which is really cool. So um, those are just a couple of them. So, so Sasha, two-part question. How does this work? Like, suppose you do something for NPR, right? Does that mean that you can't do anything for anybody else for a certain amount of time? And then do you, do journalists get paid by the story, you know, by salary? How does that usually work? There's a couple of different um, scenarios. So it depends if you're full-time working for a station under a contract or if you're freelance. So I've done both. When you're under contract, um, there's usually a clause in there that talks about, you know, what comes next, um, you know, 
they call it non-compete, like so what whatever they deem as competitors may be listed in there. Um, it may be for a certain term. It may be for a certain term after your contract ends, just depends. Um, but for freelancers, you're typically able to um, work for a variety of different publications and contribute to a variety of different publications. Um, in the case of freelancing, you're typically paid per piece or um, versus like when you're under contract, it's some sort of retainer or salary. So it just depends on, um, you know, which route you take. Uh, I've done both and both can be great depending on what it is that you're, you know, most interested in. So Sasha, hopefully I say this right. C can you talk some about your Gullah heritage? Yes, yes, that's, that is correct. And um, yes, so my heritage is, is Gullah or some people have heard it called Gullah Geechee. It's from the Sea Islands of South Carolina, although it um, can stem all the way down to North Florida. And it's a culture that's roots um, stem back to West Africa. And um, we have uh, several different heritage festivals and Gullah festivals down in South Carolina to celebrate some of our heritage. And it's something that um, is extremely important to me and a new endeavor that I am um, entering out on is creating um, digital media properties that serve the Gullah audience. And that includes um, stuff for millennials, stuff for women, um, including topics on parenting, local news and events, and just a way to kind of spotlight and connect the community. Um, some you know, celebrities, I, I guess you could say, that are of Gullah heritage include Michelle Obama and um, also Viola Davis. Um, you know, we have um, you know, a lot of people from that uh, who can trace their roots back to that community um, who are doing incredible things across the, the globe. And so my hope is to be able to tell some of those stories and amplify the work and to just raise awareness about the culture and um, you know some of the amazing things that we're doing. And there's this uh, Gullah language, right? Yes, there is. Okay, and then, and hopefully I ask this question right, um, and I could be wrong, but most black Americans cannot trace their heritage back to any specific place in Africa, right? But Gullah people can't trace it back to a specific place in Africa, right? That's correct. Uh, yeah, because of a lot of the, the records and keeping and things like that, um, it is difficult for a lot of uh, people to kind of know exactly uh, where their heritage is um, from. For instance, um, like down in uh, Louisiana, there's like, you know, the Creole community, like they're very, they, you know, speak French and they have like the different dialects and things like that. And that's kind of what I would compare Gullah to. Um, if you were looking for um, another community of, I guess you'd say brown people in the US that kind of are in touch with that. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's really interesting that the people um, in, in the community in the Sea Islands are still able to hold on to so many aspects of the culture from the dishes to maybe the sweet grass baskets or maybe the most popular thing that people have seen. They're sold, um, you know, online and, and down there for, you know, hundreds of dollars. Um, but it's a tradition that was just passed on from generation to generation. Have you ever been able to go back to where the Gullah people came from? I have not been to, um, to Africa, no. Um, so uh, I believe Sierra Leone, that around that region is, is um, a part of where the heritage stems from. And I have not had the opportunity to visit, but it's definitely on my list. So Sasha, you spent some time in the Air Force, I believe, doing public relations. Can you talk about how the Air Force, you know, affected you as far as being an entrepreneur and what you gained from it? Yes, absolutely. I think, um, you know, public service, for instance, is something that I still continue to hold very closely. And I think that um, being a veteran, you know, that's part of that. Um, I really feel that it gave me the opportunity to um, learn a different aspect of storytelling. I um, did, I took a photography class um, through my training and was able to, you know, start shooting my own things. And that's something that I didn't do before. And, um, you know, learning photojournalism in a time like, you know, the, I guess that was like the early mid 2000s is definitely a skill that I continue to use today. And it also helped me with that, just not being afraid to walk up to someone and, and just start talking to them. You know what I mean? Just being able to kind of, uh, get used to that. Um, a lot of the things I would do is going up and taking photos at events and things. You have to get people's names. And it kind of helped me with that, um, that little bit of fear of just, you know, walking up to somebody and, and just, you know, commanding their attention. <laughs> is PR in the Air Force, 
the same as doing it outside of the civilian ward? Are there other big differences? And there's a lot of differences um, when you're working with a government agency versus working um, with like a private company. Um, it's one of the differentiators. They call it public affairs versus like um, uh, public relations. But some of the elements are the same, including the um, communicating with the different audiences. So there's internal, external. So that internal would be like your fellow colleagues in private or your fellow airmen if it's in the military. Um, external would be you know, the, the public who lives around the military installation, or if it's a company, external could be um, the people who you serve with your product or service. So there are similarities and differences uh, in the, the processes and the procedures, but some of the fundamentals are, are the same across the board. Sasha, so you you put yourself in position to be successful, you know, many times. What's been your secret to put yourself in these, in these positions to be successful? Well, as you know, we say in the Perks of Admission Club, um, it, it's closed mouths don't get fed. And that means that never be afraid to speak up about what it is that you are interested in doing. Um, not to say that you should, um, you know, complain like, oh, I hate my job. I hate what I'm doing now. This is what I really want to do. But, you know, say, wow, you're working on that. I find that to be interesting. I'd love to learn more about it. Just asking questions, putting yourself out there, letting people know what your intentions are, doing your research, reading about it, looking it up, um, signing up for Google Alerts on the topic so that you can stay up to date, following people on social media who are doing the things that you're interested in doing, and looking at their accounts not with envy like, man, I really want to be there, but hey, if they can do it, I can do it. And, um, you know, I, I, you know, talking about mentorship and, and working with others, you'd be surprised how many people really, you know, don't follow people they admire because it, of, of jealousy. It's like, no, you want to follow those people because you want to see what they're doing, look at their strategy. And if, if they can do it, then you can do it. Yeah, one thing, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Google Alerts. Like, of course, I have a startup trying to get customers. So when I have a customer trying to get, uh, I do a Google Alert for them, right? So whenever that company pops up, of course, some companies not really on the internet, some are. Or it pops up, I get a notification, I can send a quick note, hey, congratulations, or, you know, whatever, you know, I think it's a great tool, and it's free. Absolutely, I agree. I use it for keeping up with pretty much any topic that I'm interested in, um, just to kind of see what people are writing about it. It helps me to know, to stay in the loop of uh, what's going on, because it's, it's difficult to stay on top of everything with so much out there. So do you, do you have a favorite social media platform right now? Let's see. You know, I, I go back and forth, um, but right now I've really gotten a lot back more into Facebook group because of group, some groups that I've in, been involved in. It was kind of surrounding uh, my high school reunion. Like for the longest, I just never even used Facebook. It was more of like Twitter, Twitter. But uh, around my 20th high school, school reunion, uh, they had a Facebook group. And with that group, I found myself, you know, very much engaged and ended up getting the app back on my phone. And now I'm kind of, you know, back into that group thing. But for me, it, it, it kind of changes. Um, I, for a while, it was LinkedIn. For a while, it was Instagram. Um, but I would say for a while, it was Reddit. <laughs> but right now, I would say it's good old Facebook. Not the not the posts or so much as like the groups. Groups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, you know, of course, like I, said, I post a lot of places. I used to be a really big fan of Snapchat. I haven't been in there for a while. It just lost it for me. I never really got involved in Twitter, even though I should. Then we got involved with Reddit and Core. But I, I mainly, I'm, I'm a big fan of TikTok right now. I like what people are doing there. And of course, like you know, TikTok, like any other social media platform, there's trash on there, of course. But there's so many good stuff. Like I follow one person who does daily sales tips. Know the person, he's, he's like the kind of tree chips, they do stuff on there. But, this, I, but like you said, you got to find the one that, that you know, your, your customer is on and, and, and go on there. Absolutely. And also the one that resonates the most with you, you know, like the one that you feel that you can be your authentic self. And it's also, you know, different. I post more on Twitter, um, you know, but I probably consume more on um, in Facebook groups right now, you know, and it's like I post more on Instagram stories and reels, but I don't. You know, I'm not necessarily like scrolling the feed on Instagram as much as I was, say, like a year ago. So it's like I, I view it as for as a creator, I view it as, you know, as a consumer and as like, you know, as, um, you know, push, pushing out content, not just, you know, consuming. Sasha, there's all this info out there, right? There's all the social media, there's the emails, the CNN, you know, Blavity, all this stuff. 
how do you, you know, keep from being overwhelmed with all this information? One thing that I do is I don't have alerts on my phone, so I don't really get push notifications for pretty much anything except um, like maybe a couple of like work related apps. Um, that helps me to not, so it's like I have to go out and look for it. It's not just constantly like popping up in my feed. Like my brother, for instance, he has like all of his news alerts on. So as soon as like something's happening, he's like looking at it and like, da da da. And I'm like, I just forget. That's just too how, how, how is he not going insane with that? I don't know. He likes to stay up to date with everything. But for me, like I don't have any social or any of those types of alerts on um, just because I, for me, it's like I'll go to it when I want to read it. And then that kind of helps. Um, other things I'll have, like, do you have, like a summary of uh, email or text or something like that? We'll be like, okay, here are like the top, like for, for Reddit, for instance, like I have like a widget on my phone and so it'll give me like one subreddit a day. And so that kind of like, you know, helps me stay plugged in, but I'm not like going down into like a whole bunch of stuff on there. Even though sometimes I click it and I end up going down <laughs> a whole bunch of stuff on there too. But, um, you know, I just kind of like try to, uh, try to, um, you know, keep it balanced a little bit. <laughs> yeah, that, that is the risk, right? You, you check something one time and two hours later, you're watching clown videos. You're like, how did I get this place? Yeah, that's what I don't want. <laughs> Sasha, can you talk about uh, a new tech or a, a tech that's coming up that's exciting you? Uh, let's see. I think that a lot of these um, AR games, it's not new, new, but it, it's, you know, it's getting, gaining popularity. I think those are a lot of fun. Um, you mentioned Snapchat, like that's one of the platforms that I think that has been, you know, really taking advantage of that technology um, a lot. Um, I also think that, uh, you know, the resurgence of audio is really interesting and it'll be really cool to see what apps um, adapt or are created to kind of like support that. For instance, um, there's a lot of apps popping up that are aggregating clubhouse rooms and, um, you know, giving you like a directory where you can see them and things like that. It's just nice to see how, you know, when there's this, you know, this resurgence of a medium, how these other, you know, startups can sort of populate around it to support it and enhance it. So that's, that's what I'm looking forward to. So I know Clubhouse was a hot thing recently, but it seemed like they almost missed the opportunity, right? It seemed like they didn't grow fast enough. Like it was first this iOS, they didn't have Android. And by the time they get Android, like, it's like everyone copied them, right? And it seemed like the numbers saying like, these have like all the crazy amount of growth before the people downloading, joining. Now it's like the numbers are actually decreasing. So do you think, what's your take on Clubhouse right now? I, I have a really, you know, you're part of that community, the Perks of Ambition community on there. And we are actually in the process of serving, engaging our members, you know, to see how they best want to connect, um, not just with Clubhouse. But okay, so we, that's where we all gather. That's how we all found each other. But, you know, are there opportunities to connect that same audience on other platforms? Um, I have been dabbling with Twitter spaces. They definitely have some features that I do like. Um, you know, like allowing people to like have their hand up um, to say, you know, where everyone can see whose hands are up and different things like that. Um, I also like the updates that Clubhouse is making um, to allow you to more quickly share different uh, snippets from your club. I think uh, one thing with Clubhouse is it, for me, it's always been more about the quality of the conversation than the quantity. I think if you're just, you know, searching for like, okay, I wanna have a room with thousands of people yeah, that is maybe not, you know, the necessarily the best goal, but what I do think are the conversations that you have taking them and using them across platforms, which you definitely made it easier to do now with clips. I think that that is, um, you know, having those or having those great conversations and taking them and sharing them across platforms, I think is really going to be the way that um, I'll continue to use Clubhouse. Sasha, so, so, so how do you keep up with all this? Like, you know, there's always a new update, new change. I think Instagram just made a lot of changes to their platform. How do you recommend people keep up with these changes? And, you know, cause like who, like who has time to go on Twitter spaces and figure out how it works? Like who has time to go to Instagram and do other stuff, right? But of course you need to, to you know, keep your content, you know, good, I think. So how do you, how do you deal with that? Well, one thing that I do is I, um, I check out their blogs, the Instagram blog, the Twitter blog. Um, they usually will have updates. They also have areas specifically for creators where they'll send you like an email and it will tell you um, some of the things so you can just kind of scan it and see 
um, you know, what's new. There's also different online communities that kind of curate that information for you. And I think those are really helpful just to kind of get like the, the big picture stuff because you're right, I'm not gonna keep up with every single update, but let me know like the big picture things that are happening or the big overhauls that are coming. Sasha, can you talk about, um, you already talked about a sum already, but can you talk about how Sasha Talks Tech got started, the idea behind it, what your focus are right now and what your vision is for it going forward? Absolutely. So um, Sasha Talks Tech started in 2013. Um, I was, I competed on a, a reality television show called Who Done It, And um, with that show, it's when I kind of decided I wanted to go independent with media. And I wanted to have a site where I could keep in touch with um, all of the people who I'd met since, um, you know, being on that show, like my uh, people that I met on Twitter and Instagram. And so that's how the blog started. Um, I kind of launched it with a cross country move from Washington DC to Los Angeles. And um, I stopped at different cities along the way and spotlighted their tech scenes. And from there, I started um, reaching out to all the different Los Angeles um, tech organizations, nonprofits, people on Meetup or Eventbrite who are having events and asking them, um, could I get media credentials, meaning so I didn't have to necessarily pay like $10 to attend every single event and then go there and then cover it and, as media. And so from there, um, I would start getting invited to events and um, getting added to different press releases and things like that. And then eventually I got asked to moderate panels and um, host events. And um, then it kind of grew from there to having the opportunity to do international panels and um, international events. And so I did an event in Dublin, the Dublin Tech Summit. I um, got to judge the startup competition there. And the folks that we chose actually ended up winning the whole thing, which was really cool. And um, I also um, got to work at the Web Summit in Lisbon. And that was also really exciting to be able to see some of the international uh, tech scene as well. Then how about uh, your, your new thing you're working on, Perks of Ambition? Like how did they get started? Why are you doing it? Your focus and what's your plan for it moving forward? Sure. So Perks of Ambition actually started um, a lot of times when I'm working on different things with Sasha Talks Tech, I'll have people DM me or email me and they're really interested. Well, how can I do kind of what you're doing? How did you get started? And they're interested. And, you know, a lot of times I just did not have the time to respond or just wasn't able to get back to them in a timely fashion. But, you know, I decided, you know what, I am going to make a concerted effort to try to bring everyone together once a month. And we're going to kind of have this conversation where people can ask whatever questions they want. And so I started doing that uh, during the pandemic on Zoom. And from that, um, I met four students um, who were really interested in delving into careers as either content creators or digital marketers or, um, you know, writers, um, screenwriters and or um, article writers. And they had been applying for all these different internships but didn't land any. So I decided to self-fund Perks of Ambition, um, which was in this case, a 10 week conscious creators uh, course. And we had these four students come through and each week they had to do a different module on brand building, on interacting um, with clients, on um, how to present themselves on social media, um, on wealth building, on having multiple revenue streams. And it was just really a great opportunity to kind of give them a crash course on, on all the things that I've learned um, over the past decade or so working in the digital space. So Sasha, for the, the, for the Academy, how did you come up with the, um, the, I guess, I can't think of the word, but like the study guide, the platform, like the process that you wanted them to follow? I actually just kind of sat down and um, made a list of 10 things that I wish that I had have known um, when I was 19 or 20, when it came to um, the digital space. And uh, granted, a lot of things that we had were not available, but some of the things like generational wealth. That was not even a term I was familiar with in my early 20s. I did not even know what generational wealth was. So, I mean, just, you know, starting there, other things like um, how, to con how to conduct an interview, how to do research for an interview, whether you're talking about an interview like the one we're doing or a job interview. That's not a class or anything that I ever took. And so it was a combination of 
um, writing those ideas down and floating it around a few people, um, my peers, I believe you may have even taken a look at the list and people gave me their feedback. And so then I tapped into my network. Who do I know who could talk about each of these topics? Because obviously I don't have 10 weeks to sit there and teach 10 classes. So how can I tap into my network? And for the classes that I wasn't able to teach, I was able to find online resources, whether they were a master class or YouTube videos or, um, you know, LinkedIn has classes and things like that, that I could steer them in the direction of, and they had to do it in their own time. And so by the end of the 10 weeks, they um, had been able to touch on each of those and are now, now have their own, you know, digital strategy on how to move forward um, while they're finishing school to already get their name out there ahead of, you know, landing their first job when they graduate. So, so, so what's the application process for this? And then how did you pick these four people? What's your process for picking the people? For these four, these are actually people who just reached out to me through social media and they had been showing up every month to the monthly um, mentor meetups. And um, it wasn't a formal application process. I just asked to see some of the writing examples and things like that. Um, but moving forward, I, do, I would like to do it again um, for the summer 2022. And I will be um, posting on Perks of Ambition um, more information about how creators will be able to apply. Um, we'll be opening it up in uh, March and making selections by May for our summer 2022 co cohort. And some of the things that we're looking for are just people who are um, you know, able to really just dive in and commit to showing up and being a part of the community. Um, some of the deliverables include attending clubhouse rooms, hosting clubhouse rooms, um, going on LinkedIn and, and working on their profiles, interviewing people, um, informational interviews and interviews that they'll um, turn into content, blog posts, things like that. And so you have to be outgoing. Um, if you're not a great writer, that's okay. Um, there are other ways that you can tell your story. We had, um, you know, a couple of folks who were writers. We also had a couple of folks who are more into video content. And so we're willing to work with you, um, but we are looking to um, have a class. Um, we're looking at five, but if we're able to get more funding, maybe we can move it to 10. So yeah, I'm really excited about that. Yes. And then can you talk some about, I think it's called STT News? Yes. Yeah, so um, as part of um, having Sasha Talks Tech and Perks of Ambition, I really wanted to have um, a place to really just push out all of our content to the audiences as they're interested in it. In, in it. And so what I did was uh, we created STT News, um, sort of like Sasha Talks Tech News, just abbreviated it. And that is, that is a site where you'll be able to catch all of our story content, whether it's um, the content created through Perks of Ambition, which is more like art and culture, um, music and movie reviews from the black and brown perspective, or if you're just interested in the tech tips from a small business perspective, you're looking in for our guides, maybe travel, that type of thing. And we're also launching um, a newsletter service. It's 100% free. Um, there's no cost to any of our subscribers. And we'll be delivering these customized customized guides to you each week based off of your interests. So we'll send you a quick survey. You can select the categories of content you're interested in. And then each week you'll be delivered original content and curated content on those topics from our team. So for uh, Sasha Talks Tech, Perks Ambition, STT News, do you have these, do you have these as separate companies all, all, all or like one company under, under Sasha Talks Tech? They're all separate, but if you're interested in checking all of them out in one place, um, I can give you the link. You can check out digital-info, and that's a list of all of our digital properties, and it allows you to kind of pick and choose which ones that you're interested in, preview some of the content. Um, I do have partners that I'm working with on um, Perks of Ambition, um, although Sasha Talks Tech, that is um, a sole proprietorship. That is just me. So for Perks of Ambition, do you have like the a perfect candidate that you want to apply? Is it like a is that target market you're trying to get with the with your with the applicants? You know, I really um, although our cohort over summer 2021 was um, comprised of all Gen Z members, I really am open to um, folks from other generations because you know just because you're you know from Gen X or whatever, doesn't mean that you don't have a story to tell and that you, uh, you know, it's too late or something like that for you to pick up um, these skills. And so I really welcome 
um, people from all backgrounds and all generations to consider taking a look at the program. It's 10 weeks, a 10 week intensive that will really allow you to just go ahead and take um, whatever idea you have for your brand to the next level. And, you know, it's an opportunity to earn some money and create content that will be published through um, all of our different sites. So I, said, I think you bring a good point on diversity. I think a lot of people think diversity is only like sex or gender, but it's diversity. I mean, it can be like you said, you know, uh, you know, boomers and Generation X and millennials think differently. You know, it could even be religion, right? I mean, absolutely. So people, when people get it wrong, I think. It's people of all backgrounds and making sure that they're represented. And I think that it's important to, you know, all backgrounds means all backgrounds. We need people, um, you know, who who look like all of us to be at the table so that we're able to collaborate. And that's something that's really important to me. Um, I, that's one of the reasons why I sort of use the term multicultural, although it's more than culture, like you said, it's also multi-generational, but really just amplifying diverse voices, which is the tagline of Perks of Ambition. And diverse, like you said, can be religion, can be gender, can be age, can be a lot of different things. Can you talk some about the monthly mentorship you do? I think the, the one you do on Clubhouse. Yes. Yeah, so our next uh, event is going to be happening the first Saturday of November. Um, these events happen each month. Um, we're going to be um, talking with folks this month about the, dig the, the different digital platforms that I'm working on and kind of using it as a focus group to get a better sense of the stories that um, our audience is interested in um, and hearing about it really just started as, like I said, people saying, hey, I'd really love to pick your brain and just not having time to meet with, you know, 10 different people individually. So it's kind of a standing monthly, um, we do it on Clubhouse and on Zoom, where you can just sort of tap in, listen in, um, and just collaborate. We've had some really great partnerships, um, opportunities that have come from it for um, our attendees. And uh, we definitely would love to, you know, have all, um, your audience come and join us. I know that you've been there for almost all of them, Jason. So we appreciate your support. No, no, no problem. This is a great experience. So the people who attend these monthly mentorship, what, what do you want them to get out of it? Well, I like to say that mentorship isn't just um, someone older helping someone younger. I think that there, you can learn just as much from the um, college students that are there as they can learn from you. Um, whether it's perspective, whether it's um, balancing ideas, whether it's just trying to get a better understanding of a concept or why something is trending or why something like why like one time we actually had a conversation about like why TikTok, you know, like with with folks from generation um, X to Gen Z talking about why they liked it and people like me who are millennial talking about like, I don't get it, you know? So it just, you know, it just depends on the topic. We also talk about things like um, the future um, when it comes to like drones, we get an expert come on and talk about um, what it's gonna look like in the next um, 10 to 20 years with like the drone highway that's gonna be in the sky. And, you know, we just really um, just kind of, we're just talking about things that interest us, but it's a chance to do something on one Saturday a month where you're kind of just, hanging out, you know, in the morning, uh, it's 12 to 1 30 Eastern time, but, uh, you know, so it's pretty early in the day, but you're able just to come in and just, um, listen or be engaged in the conversation. And one thing about these, these things like this, you never know what's going to leave. It's like, I don't know, Fallon was on there one time. She wants to be a screenwriter, I have a good friend, Al Anneman, who spent like 15 years in film production and production in, in Hollywood. Right. And so I connected them, right. It had, it had some, it had some good conversation. Right. So if I hadn't been there, I would have known about it. You know, so you never know what kind of connections you make by doing this kind of stuff. Absolutely. And that's kind of what it's all about. Just getting like, you know, like I said, some of the most interesting, some of the most brilliant people I know in, in the same Zoom room or clubhouse room. <laughs> that's kind of the goal. And just see what happens. Just have a conversation. So can you give like just some general advice for young people, either like job searching or finding their way? If What, what should young people be doing right now? Well, definitely tapping into your network, not being afraid to ask questions, not being afraid to reach out. Um, informational interviews, there are a thing, you know, where you're reaching out like, hey, I really just have a few questions about the career that you have, um, something that I'm interested in. Just don't be afraid to look for people who are doing what you're doing and uh, finding them on social media and reaching out. 
and not everyone's going to write you back, but you know, it's a numbers game. If you, if you reach out to 10 people, likely one of them will get back to you and you never know what will come from that opportunity. You definitely have more access to people than we've ever had before. So, you know, if they have an account, why not like hit them up on it? You know, you never know what can happen from that. Yeah. I would definitely say if your attitude is like, I'm not going to reach out to no one because they're not going to, they're not going to answer. You got to change the attitude. Absolutely. You have to just do it and not worry about um, the result. It's really just like, you know, putting in the effort and um, the more you, the more you reach out, someone will get back with you and maybe tweak your message, you know, see, like, is there something that you could do better? Maybe have a, a friend or a colleague look over what you're writing and get some feedback. But um, you just have to, you just have to keep going. You can't give up. Sasha, what's your take on the work-life balance? Work-life balance is extremely important. And I think that um, more than ever before, um, it's something that's coming to the forefront. And I think that's great. Um, amid the pandemic, you know, uh, I was one of those people who, you know, kind of found myself working even more than I did before because of not having the commute and then, all, you know, being just so readily available all of the time. And you really have to put up those boundaries and take care of yourself and, um, I love that it's important. I love that companies are making it a priority. And it's something that we cover extensively on Sasha Talks Tech. Um, if you go and click on the Tech Life, you'll be able to check out some of our guides and our resources for entrepreneurs on how to carve out that space. And um, you know, as you're hiring people, make sure that you're providing that same thing to your, um, your team. Something that I do with the team is um, I started um, doing a weekly uh, stand-up um, automated uh, email, basically just asking them, you know, how are you feeling? Is there anything blocking you? Are you running into any challenges? Like, you know, just to kind of get an idea of what's going on with them and that can kind of help me manage their workflow and their workload so that I'm, you know, in touch with other things they have going on. Like we like to think like, you know, everyone's just working on our work and that's all they're doing, but there are other things going on in their lives, whether it's personal, whether it's, you know, health related. And so really just kind of getting, you know, a sense of what's going on it helps to manage expectations. Sasha, how do you take care of yourself? I definitely say no a lot. <laughs> um, I used to kind of like feel obligated to attend everything and, and go to every single event, but now I really do, uh, you know, take, take the time to say no and, and really just to budget off and block off time for things. Um, I definitely um, enjoy just like curling up with a book or um, with an old movie um, that really just uh, unwinding. Um, sometimes I'll do a digital detox where I get rid of all of my social media off of my phone for like the weekend. I just kind of spend an entire weekend with no social media, which can be really relaxing. Um, and I also, you know, try to make time for um, like a mani pedi every now and then. Like <laughs> I find that to be really relaxing. <laughs> so. To me, I think public speaking skill everyone needs to have, right? What's your advice to young people to get them ready to be a public speaker? What do you need, what should they be doing? Well, there's a lot of opportunities now, particularly with the apps like we were just talking about. Um, you can go live on Instagram or YouTube or, you know, start a room on Clubhouse. But I think, you know, those are the best ways to really, you know, they'd say before or join Toastmasters or some public speaking organization, but you can now do it right from, you know, your, your phone. So I would say just, just jump in there, find a conversation that's somewhat interesting to you, get on stage and, and add your two cents and um, just go from there. But practice makes perfect and just keep it up and you'll get there. So Sasha, when you bring people onto your company, what kind of characteristics do you look for in, in those people? I think it's really important um, for any candidate to have an understanding of what it is that we do. So I really am always impressed by people who have done their research and are aware and can add something to like a conversation. Um, oh yeah, I remember seeing that or they might mention something that we recently covered. Um, I also really just like enthusiasm, um, you know, natural enthusiasm, um, someone who's really just curious and interested in uh, learning. Um, for me, uh, everything I do is about learning. So um, I'm a lifelong learner and I feel that it's important to try to learn something new every day. And so um, I think anyone who's curious, bright, and just really eager to jump in wherever they're needed are definitely um, some of the characteristics that I found work best with the candidates that we've hired. 
Sasha, is there anything else that I asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about that we haven't covered yet? No, I just uh, would love to say that I really enjoyed uh, being part of the experience and um, I would love uh, for everyone to head over to the site and check it out. If you want to take a preview of all of our properties, you can go to digital-.info and that will link you to all of our sites. We're really excited about, um, you know, contributing to the digital ecosystem and uh, you'll be seeing uh, a feature story on Jason on the site very soon as well. Uh, our our, our colleague Fallon wrote that. <laughs> um, so I understand you have something for our listeners as well. Yes. Um, just in time for the holidays, we are working on curating um, a black and brown digital e-guide that will e-book that will allow you to shop from your phone or from your computer or forward it to someone who you'd uh, like to share that with. So if you head over to our site, you can subscribe, uh, digital-info. And um, yeah, I think it's gonna be a really great gift. Uh, we're teaming up with all of the creators who we've met through the Clubhouse ecosystem, as well as um, through our variety of Facebook groups. And we're going to, this is gonna be a living document that is gonna be um, continuously updated so that we uh, just can provide this resource at no cost to the community. And to our listeners, we'll have Sasha's social media links and a gift on our show notes. you find the show notes at www.cabinetstakestallblog.com. And be sure to share this episode and rate, review, and subscribe to the Jason Cabinet Experience on your favorite platform. Sasha, we're coming to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice or anything you want to talk about? Um, I guess I would say with final thoughts is just don't forget to start uh, where you are. You know, you may not necessarily have it all figured out, but if you're able to set that goal and just try to do something to just move, move the needle just a little bit each day, maybe it's doing research, maybe it's, uh, you know, watching some videos on YouTube, maybe it's listening to some podcasts like this one uh, of somebody who's doing something similar, but just keep, as long as you can stay inspired, you can make it happen. And um, that's what storytelling to me is all about. Sasha, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. Keep up the great work. Thank you. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.